Well, hello, and uh, a very warm welcome to uh, another interview here on our, our, our Facebook page here. And uh, it's really wonderful to welcome today to the Godcast the very Reverend Richard Sewell, who is the Dean of St George's College in Jerusalem and is also the residentiary, residentiary canon of St George's Cathedral. Uh, jo, uh, Richard, a very good afternoon to you. How are you? I'm um, well, Alex. Thank you so much. It's great to join you this way and uh, everybody who's joining us. Uh, it's really wonderful to welcome you to uh, our, our Godcast this afternoon. What's, uh, what's the weather like there in Jerusalem in this uh, time of October? Well, it's normally lovely weather. This is a good time of year to come when, when pilgrims, travellers do come. October is a great month, but actually we're really in the midst of something of a heat wave. Uh, at least for Jerusalem. So all week it's been 30 degrees plus, and today's the hottest, it's 34 degrees. And um, so I've just been out for our daily walk, uh, my wife Julianne and I, uh, we try and make sure we get out and just exercise a bit because with things being quiet with lockdown, if you don't do that, as everybody back home in the UK knows as well, if you don't pay attention to your physical health, then everything else begins to go and it's hot and sweaty out there. But up in Galilee at the moment, I gather it's 40 degrees Gosh. and it's much more humid up there. The advantage of Jerusalem is because we're, uh, we're over 2000 feet above sea level, there's a coolness to that. It's very rarely really humid mm -hmm. and you often get a cooling breeze as well. And we really thank God for that. It does make a difference. Okay. Well, it sounds lovely. You've, I think we're all a little bit envious here in East Lancashire where it's about 11 degrees and we've had an awful lot of rain this week. So, but uh, never mind. Right, we'll move on now. I suppose um, quite a few people will be expecting me to dive in with the deep theological questions. But I did notice on your Twitter feed that you are a lifelong fan of a certain Mr. Paul Weller. I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about that uh, fascination in Mr. Weller. Yeah, well, it has been lifelong. I probably first uh, heard the jam when I was 15, um, which for some people uh, in the All Mod Cons era might be a bit of a, uh, a late to the party, but uh, that was it for me. And it just totally changed my taste in music. Before that, I was sort of just, you know, anything that was in the charts. And then punk came along, uh, which came late to the West Country. Uh, probably 78, early 78 was about it. Uh, but no, it really changed my direction in music. I actually threw away a lot of the stuff that I'd previously got. Really? And it was a sort of year zero for me. And for that, for me, it was the jam, the clash, uh, the buzzcocks, the undertones, and then into New Wave, and it was Elvis Costello and um, all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And then right the way through Weller's uh, career with the Star Council and then all the solo stuff, I, I'm a sort of completist. I've, I, I mean, I don't buy things anymore, but before that I did, I bought every album, every single, um, and I've seen him on numerous occasions, met him on a few occasions, really? actually incredibly by chance. Okay. And uh, my music's how, been a how really- How you met thing. him, Richard? How, how was he? He was delightful, actually. You know, uh, one time I bumped into him uh, just, just off Oxford Street and he was in the same, cafe as my mate and I and we did a slightly fanish sort of thing and there weren't many tables and we just said can we sit at your table he was so chilled with that he was just about to go for his haircut and we chatted and uh, I can almost remember exactly everything that was said yeah um, and then I bumped into him another time and he was chatty and you know I didn't get his autograph I don't do that sort of thing mm. it's not very cool is it no, but, no. Um, I was just delighted that he chatted and um, yeah, music's been an important part of my life. I mean, I preach about it. It's remained, I, I still try and listen to the contemporary stuff and my daughter's in a band yeah. and um, she's, her band's got their first album coming out uh, in a few weeks time. So we're very excited about that. Well, I did have lots, I've got lots of questions, but you've, you've just said something there that, you know, it was an important part of your life. I, I'm, forgive me, uh, Rich, I'm a little bit younger than you, but I, I've kind of had a lifelong, um, love with uh, the band Depeche Mode, who um, I've just found incredible in terms of theological songwriting and things like that. But um, I, I went to uh, uh, 
in, in conversation afternoon with uh, Rick Buckler, who was the drummer from the jam. Oh, yes. And that Brilliant. was really fascinating. And uh, But it was also quite sad as well. And I, don't, I certainly don't want to burst any bubbles about Paul Weller, but the split was quite acrimonious. And, um, and the relationship has never healed to this day, which I find really quite sad. No, I think it was, I mean, to everybody, every fan of the jam, it was a terrible thing because the, the friendship, what we saw as a friendship between the three was something really important. It wasn't for me and for most of my friends who were fans, it wasn't all about Weller by any means, but it was a horrible break. And he just made a complete, walked away from them, had no contact. In fact, he latterly did re-engage contact with Bruce Foxton, the bass player, when Paul heard that his wife had died of cancer and uh, he I think sort of just compassion took over and mm. Fox played on a couple of tracks on one of his albums a few years ago yeah. and I was really pleased to hear that because it's terrible to see a relationship close friendship break down like that it's very yeah. sad I can tell you're a fan because Rick Buckler told that story because, although Rick Buckler I don't think has had any contact with him since they split up no. which was just, I, I, I express my sadness at that, really, to have no, some it, uh, success. It, it doesn't, I'm afraid there are a number of stories about Paul Weller that don't paint him in the best light. And this is it. Our, our, our heroes don't have to be saints, no. but we do like them to be admirable. I think there are many things to admire about Weller, but of course, as in any life, there are things which um, don't <clears throat> put them in the best light. I just, I'm, I'm going to pursue this a little bit, uh, Richard, if I may, just because um, Dave Garn, who is uh, the lead singer of Depeche Mode, he, he is a, you know, he's an absolute hero of mine, but he, but he did have a dreadful drug problem and yeah, uh, went right to the very edge. And, uh, but would you agree that sometimes in their people's most darkest moment, they can be their most brilliant as well? Do you go along well, with I that? Think I think our greatest qualities often have the potential to be our great um, fall down as well. So, you know, somebody's creativity, perhaps we often think creativity and substance abuse might go hand in hand. And often artists find that they, in order to access those things which are their most creative, they need something that is mood altering or mind expanding. And of course, you play a very dangerous game there. But I think when you go down to the depths of human experience, in your moments of greatest loss or sadness, or when you feel damaged, you touch on that, the truth of the human condition. And I think for me, artists that know how to sing and write about things uh, of the most profound significance are the artists that I find most satisfying and, and personally engaging and well as uh, lyrics are infused with faith. Uh, I, a lot of people don't realize that he's written very explicitly about Christianity, about he has a fascination with Jesus Christ. Uh, he has absolutely no time for organized religion. Well, he's not, he's not alone there, um, but he, he has written widely, almost every album, has something which is explicitly religious. Mm. And, um, and, and he is somebody of a deep spirituality. Mm. And I think uh, when you reflect on those things that are really important in life, uh, and maybe which are the way in which you make sense of your own wounds, then you connect with other people. And maybe Dave Gahan is the same, you know, because he clearly went to the edge of human experience and very nearly tipped over into uh, death. Yeah, thank but, you. Uh, that, that, that's the fascination too. Yeah, great. I think, I think we're on the same song sheet there, definitely. Thank you. I'm um, just, okay, well, um, just uh, we better put music to one side for a moment, but um, so um, Jerusalem, it's, um, it's an unusual job move to say the least. So what, what took you there? Uh, you know, obviously God took you there, but how did that, how did it come about? Well, it was a surprise to me because I really hadn't imagined that it would be the next step. I was a, a rector of a team ministry in a very smart part of London, south of the river in Barnes. Uh, I absolutely loved it there. Um, I'm not sure I would have stayed there uh, 
very much longer because I'm not a sort of stay for 20 years type of person. Uh, but I'd been there eight years. And then um, I came, I brought my own parish on pilgrimage. And uh, a friend of mine actually was serving in Jerusalem. And uh, when I came to the cathedral on the Sunday morning, he tapped me on the shoulder and said, Richard, uh, I don't know if you know, but we've got a vacancy at the, at the college. Um, and we're hoping to find a replacement. I said, well, good luck with that appointment. That's obviously a big job for somebody. Um, and he said, well, actually, I was wondering whether you might consider it. And I, I literally laughed at him. I just said, I think you've got the wrong person. I don't think this is for me. Anyway, I, I came back home and my wife hadn't come on the pilgrimage. And I said, you'll never guess what. Uh, somebody suggested this. Uh, how ridiculous. My wife is much more intuitive and in touch yeah. with God and um, many things than me. She said, well, maybe we should just take a look at it. Right. And we did take a look, closer look. And as is often the way that God works unexpectedly, um, touching parts of you that you're not often maybe even in touch with yourself. Um, and it, well, it sparked something in me. Mm -hmm. I, had, I had lived in Israel, actually, immediately after university. I'd worked as a volunteer in a Church of Scotland hotel up on the Sea of Galilee. Okay. Um, and so it had, there was something in me that had found an affinity with the Holy Land and the places of, that uh, we read about in the Bible. Uh, and the political situation here had remained sort of important to me. So when I started to consider going back, it wasn't something entirely new uh, in that way. And uh, the more I looked at it, the more it felt to be something that drew uh, deep interest and a spiritual yearning in me. Um, and to my amazement, I mean, I kept thinking, well, a door is going to shut, but actually every door that I put my hand to, it sort of yeah. fell open. And uh, suddenly I found myself being offered the job um, I remember the moment very clearly. I was really, you know, people talk about uh, you actually lost for words. And I, I really was, my jaw fell open. And for about a minute, I couldn't say anything. And eventually I managed to pull yeah. myself together and say, well, I'm delighted and overwhelmed and I'd love to accept. But yeah. it really was a surprise. And how did that and then I found myself with, here? How did that go down with fam, you know, your extended family to say, right, we're, we're leaving London, we're, we're heading for yeah, my, my kids, who, my kids at the time were uh, 17 and 19. Mm. And uh, they were really shocked. They did actually both burst into tears. Um, and I, that, I decided then I couldn't go. But by the next morning, my son had said, Dad, I think this is great for you. I, I think you should go and I'm proud of you. Yeah, go. Mm -hmm. And our daughter took a little bit longer, but she, she could see that it was something that really connected for me and for my wife. My wife didn't come out for another year. So she took some time with our daughter, especially who was mm -hmm. uh, just finishing off at, uh, at school. Yeah. And, um, and then only when we really felt they were both okay with it and we'd got made an arrangement for them did Julianne come out as well and she's been out for a year since then yeah and and you've been there a couple of years now is that right yep it's just, just I've just completed my second year but of course the last seven months has been something completely different and yeah unexpected. And is, it, is it everything you expected it to be so far or, or is it Everything and, and so much more. Yeah, everything and so much more. It's it's been the fullest, richest, uh, most challenging experience in ministry that I've ever had. I mean, essentially, the college is a centre for pilgrimage, and so, and we have pilgrims who come from all over the world. Although it's called St George's College, you could really more accurately call it St George's Pilgrim Centre. Uh, because really mostly we have people that come for between a week and two weeks and we organize their pilgrimage for them and we have people coming from America and Canada, the UK, uh, New Zealand, uh, Tanzania, Kenya, uh, South Africa, Sri Lanka um, and our groups comprise across that variety of places uh, though the majority at the moment are probably from the United States. Yeah. 
And in, and in terms of uh, just kind of looking at beyond the college, kind of, is, is there much interfaith stuff going on in, in Jerusalem at the moment? How's that? Um, I mean, being Jerusalem and being a sort of a strong focus for Jews, Muslims and Christians and large numbers of each of those faiths being here, you'd think it would be really vibrant for interfaith. But actually, because the relationships between those three faiths are so tense because of the politics, it's very difficult to get um, conversations going between the three faiths. Mm. But there are a few little groups that I belong to, which at a very sort of low key level, keep a conversation going. And those are, I really cherish those. And there are a few um, NGOs and organizations that are really trying to work across the barriers and the, the divides. So there's a group called Jerusalem Peace Builders that I connect with, and they bring together young people of the three faiths from America and from Israel and Palestine. Uh, and they do sort of summer schools, summer camps, either here or in America trying to get a conversation going at a young age. And often, you know, the, the Christians, Muslims and Jews, they don't have friends much across yeah. the faith, or at least between Israelis and Palestinians. That's often very difficult. And then there's another group called Roots that's based out just outside Bethlehem. And they try and bring together uh, Jewish settlers and uh, Palestinians to get a conversation going, and I'm part of a conversation group there. Um, but at the sort of level of the leaders, it's very difficult. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and when it does happen, it's very tense. But there are a number, David Rosen, Rabbi David Rosen, who's a leading Jewish person working in the interfaith field, he tries to get things going at a more sort of leader level. And when he gets when he organizes something, I try to uh, latch onto that and be part of it. And then we do our own interfaith course here at the college. We call Sharing Perspectives. And once a year, we bring together Jews, Muslims, and Christians from different parts of the world to come as pilgrims together, to travel as pilgrims. And we go and visit each other's holy places right. and then have conversations with one another, um, with one another about being in the holy places right uh, and that is really profound i can imagine really yeah very moving and sometimes quite difficult but yeah. we don't avoid the difficult conversations yeah. i think that's really important I, I was wondering i mean obviously you do those pilgrim tours do you do you do you allow yourself some time to get down into old jerusalem just as an individual Yes, yes, I, I do. I, it's really important to me to go and just spend time. At the moment, uh, there's actually no access into the, uh, in the uh, coronavirus restrictions. We can't get into the old city, but it's just 10 minutes walk away from here. And in normal times, and once the tight restrictions have lifted again, I just go in and have a wander around, go down to the Western Wall, spend some time there, often into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, but also I like to go into other churches and just walking in the streets and being around for me is a profoundly <clears throat> spiritual experience. Um, up onto the Mount of Olives, I love to go up there and just enjoy the vista across the old city. It's beautiful. It's, um, as, you're, as you're talking about some of those things, I was very fortunate to, to visit the Holy Land myself this year. And um, somebody said to me that it, it, it gives you a whole new perspective on your ministry. And... Um, Earlier this week, I was uh, fortunate to interview a gentleman called Gordon Burns, you might remember, presented the uh, Krypton Factor in the 80s oh, and yes. 90s. Right, and yeah, yeah. Gordon, it was a lovely interview, but Gordon was very clear to state his uh, position of being a profound atheist on the grounds that there, he, you know, there was no evidence to back it up. And uh, my, my kind of response to him was, well, I was fortunate to go to the Holy Land and some of the evidence there was extraordinary. I was just wondering, you just talked about a few of those places. Can you just expand a bit, little bit, Richard, on some of those key places in the old city that, that you find, you know, particularly spiritual? Yeah, well... Um, and evidential as well, of course. Yeah, I mean, the Holy Sepulchre is the primary one. Um, now, 
people might be surprised to know that the place of Jesus's crucifixion, Golgotha, actually is surrounded by a church. But what the early Christians did was to mark the places that were felt to be uh, places of significance for Jesus's death and resurrection and created a little sort of worship space. And then Emperor Hadrian, wanting to uh, crush the Christian presence here, actually built a huge temple, Roman temple, on top of those holy sites. But what he did by doing that was preserve the holy sites uh, for Christians um, by simply putting another temple on top of it. And when in Emperor Constantine's time in the early fourth century, his mother, Queen Helena, came to rediscover the Christian holy places, all they had to do was to, well, you say all you had to do, but it's quite an operation, was to dig down beneath the Roman temple. And there they found um, the, the, the tomb of Jesus's uh, burial and resurrection and the top of the quarry, which was thought to be Golgotha. And archeologically, the evidence for that as the place of Jesus's death are almost undeniable because there is um, evidence beyond the Bible as to uh, where people were likely to have been crucified and it was outside the city walls at the time and it was a quarry and there were places of burial. There are first century tombs in that area and you can go and see them in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, and so when you're in there, once you get beyond the sort of the, the, uh, the altars and the mosaics and those more uh, not first century uh, um, things of significance, you get a real sense that this was a place of burial. And then to go into the tomb itself, now, we don't know for absolutely certain it was the tomb where Jesus was buried and resurrected, but there's a very strong chance it was that place. And if not, it was a grave very nearby. So you can't really leave it without a sense that you have been very close to the places that were where Jesus was at the very end of his life. Yeah. And if nothing else, it has been a place of pilgrimage since the early 300s. Yeah. And that takes us very close back to the, to the end of Jesus's life, you know, just a few hundred years. Yeah. So I, I always get filled with a sense of profound spirituality when I'm there and simply walking the streets. Yeah. Um, you know, although we know that the actual streets where Jesus walked in many places were probably um, 20 feet below street level now, you still know that you are in the vicinity and uh, places like uh, the temple, um, uh, Herod's temple, Solomon's temple, um, were the places where Jesus was. The Garden of Gethsemane is still the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. You know, it's the same places. And some would suggest that some of the ancient trees are the same olive trees that uh, Jesus would have prayed in amongst on the last night before he was arrested. Yeah. It, it is a profound place. And it you, is, you it yourself, Alex, it's something that, you know, never fails to touch people. Mm -hmm. Even quite skeptical people get touched by it. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, so many people said to me, oh, you know, go, it's going to be too busy. And, and I was absolutely determined to make, find it out for myself. And, uh, I went to the Holy Sepulchre when it was absolutely rammed and I went, I think, two, three other times at six o'clock in the morning and every time I just felt, oh, I just felt so, uh, I just felt like I had a, a warmth about me, a glow about being there and um, just a wonderful place. And what you said about the pilgrimage is um, is very profound as well. The, the volume of people from every breadth and space of this planet come come to Jerusalem and and that is extraordinary I've never seen anything like that before no you see these large groups of um, Koreans South Koreans Chinese uh, Brazilians in large numbers um, Indians 
you know, it really is like every nation under heaven. Yeah, and there's, and a, tiny, there's a tiny little chapel, isn't there? Is it the Ethiopian chapel? Uh, do you mean around the back of the... Yeah, just around the back, yeah. Coptic, uh, so yeah. the Egyptian Orthodox. It's yes. one of my favourite places yeah, to go. Yeah, beautiful. Like beautiful. And yeah. It's, it's so, so special. Um, and, you know, the more I go, I mean, I've now been in so many hundreds of times, I, I've lost count, mm. but every time I go... Uh, I'm struck by something and I love taking people there for the first time and just to go and say a prayer with them uh, when they go in and just to orientate them around it. And, you know, Alex, it's the most amazing thing to see people have a profound spiritual experience in that place um, when they're seeing these things for the very first time. Uh, it, it's one of the great privileges of being here is just to walk into the old city yeah. and show people around and what is it what has it done to you being there for the last two years as well, you know it's a difficult question i suppose but has it changed you in any way or yet or uh, uh, it, it has certainly made my faith more heartfelt you know i i think it's really connected very personally for me just to be steeped in the places of such spiritual and religious significance. Um, and I think the other thing, the, the, the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians, between Jews, Muslims, Christians, um, feels even more personal to me now. Um, and the, 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 the grievance, the sadness, the loss and the pain for Palestinians is something I think I will never shake off. Mm. Um, you know, I feel Richard, a profound... Richard, Richard, could I ask you to, because I think I was naive and uh, dreadfully ignorant to the plight of the Palestinians, and I learned a lot about it when I was there. If I ask you to put this down into its most simplest form, because, you know, a lot of people who watch this channel, uh, I think, will be the same. Um, mm. How would you kind of sum up the situation as simply as you possibly can? Gosh, it's, it, it, it's an incredibly difficult thing to distill this place and its complex history into anything that is simple. But I think, since you put me on the spot, you said you weren't going to give me any... Sorry, I'm really... <laughs> you, 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 you bowled that googly at me. Um, uh, you know, the, there are here competing narratives. Uh, and there is no way of merging them together to get a coherent story, single story. You have to deal with the fact that the different peoples have a different account of what has occurred and each one has its own truth and integrity. And if you're looking to say, yeah, but who's right? You're starting from the wrong place. For Jews, the creation of the State of Israel in 1948 was not creating something new, but was recreating something ancient, which had been lost. And in that creation, a miracle occurred for them and their joy at what they've been able to create uh, in the 70 years since is something of, they feel, an unparalleled achievement. But at the same time, the creation of the State of Israel in 1947 was the most catastrophic disaster for the people who had known this as their home uh, for years before. Now, of course, there were Jews that had lived here before the State of Israel, but the Palestinians uh, had known nothing else. Uh, and their, their peoples went back generations and generations as well, and had never imagined that it would stop being their country. Uh, and their sense of having been robbed of something, which previously they had just taken for granted, is a, is a weeping wound that they cannot come to terms with. And now you've got the state of Israel, and you've got the Palestinian territories and they live side by side, but the Palestinians have no state, they have no nation, they have no passport, they have very limited rights 
even under international law, let alone those places and things that the State of Israel has taken beyond what was given to them uh, by right in 1947 by United Nations resolutions. And the two just live alongside each other in a perpetual state of conflict. Um, and both have their rights and both have their grievances, both feel aggrieved. Um, and somehow the world has not found a way to help to bring about any sort of resolution. Um, and I feel um, sadness for both yeah. and sadness for this, this region and this holy land, which has known such unholy division and hatred. And my prayer is that all the peoples of these lands would come to a point where they can know it as home and feel like they are allowed to live at peace in their home. But at the moment, that resolution uh, defies us. Yeah. It is deeply, uh, as, as it was a wonderful trip, there were some real moments of great sadness for me being there. Uh, I was struck by Bethany, I think it was. I visited an orphanage in Bethany. And, it, and the, the yeah. orphanage yeah. was doing some wonderful stuff. But the the the, the area, because it, I believe it was Palestinian controlled, yeah. uh, which there was no love and care. The, you know, the sanitation looked dreadful. The environment looked very stark and harsh. And it was, it yeah. was deeply moving to see it actually. Yeah, no, it, it really, it really is. And, um, you know, I think people don't realize that the Christian community, the Palestinian Christians here are in such a devastated state of uh, neglect. And so many Palestinians have left because they see no future here. So the Christian community, which uh, pre-1947 probably accounted for 25 to 30% of the population, now is down to 2% of the population in Israel and Palestine. And uh, they are just in such small numbers, but they're, they're faithful, they're determined, they're creative. They are, I mean, they're a profound witness to me when I'm able to go and uh, worship because I the college is, is a is an institution of the Diocese of Jerusalem it's a, yeah. a Palestinian Anglican Church so yeah. my my bishop is uh, the bishop in Jerusalem uh, is Palestinian uh, the archbishop in Jerusalem is a Palestinian um, and and all my clergy colleagues almost all bar two are Palestinians yeah, uh, Jordanians or or Israelis or uh, in the West Bank, um, uh, but they witness to me, they minister to me, they encourage me, and they are not despairing, no. though they are sometimes sad and angry. Um, and uh, it's it's really important that the global Christian community does not forget the Absolutely. Palestinian Christians yes. and that. They do whatever they can to support them. Whatever their politics, whatever they believe about the state of Israel, doesn't matter. You can still support Palestinian Christians yeah. and their uh, desire to live here faithfully and to maintain a strong Christian presence here. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Richard, for your insights. Uh, when, when, when I was there, uh, just by chance, I wasn't on the uh, VIP list, but we, uh, I came along to the 100th anniversary of... Uh, of, of the college, no. um, the, oh, it, we were with McCabe. So we're going to the cathedral for Sunday uh, Holy Communion. I thought this would be nice, and and it was it was uh, very uh, all the uh, pomp and ceremony there. It was wonderful, but it was yeah. like back in for an hour or two. It's very English, isn't it? <laughs> it's very very English. Yes, it is. I mean, the the cathedral was built at the end of the nineteenth century by um, Bishop Blythe, who was um, who was from London. Yeah. And he just wanted, you know, so often the Anglican church did as it went around the world, wanted to create a little bit of England in the midst of whatever culture it was. But he, he worked very respectfully with the local Christian community mm. and did a wonderful job. Yeah. Um, it's, and that is vital. Richard, the, this, this time has just absolutely flown by. I've found it absolutely fascinating oh, yeah. talking to you. Um, just a, a quick 
quick throwing ones. What, what are you missing most about uh, home, UK? Well, do you know, the thing I miss most uh, is um, scones, clotted cream and jam. <laughs> what I would give for a proper scone. I'm from Devon, um, so uh, with my cup of tea, oh, I would love that. But you know, bits of, I love the climate here, yeah. but I do miss those crisp autumn days with the leaves turning golden. Mm. That is something, uh, I, I did say that I, I missed the rain a bit. It hasn't rained here since um, the middle of April. Uh, we're waiting for the first rains. And I did, when I went back briefly to the UK uh, a month ago, I said I was missing the rain, but after two days of solid rain up in Cheshire, I decided I, I wasn't missing it all that much. Uh, um, you were just, uh, you were saying that I, you're heading north and my, kind of one of my final questions was, have you got any connections with Lancashire? Have you ever even been to uh, Burnley? Um, I had not been to Burnley, but I was, I spent some time in, Bolton, uh, when I was at uh, university in Birmingham, we did a uh, we did a mission up to a church in uh, Bolton, and I was and I was at university. I did my postgraduate diploma in youth work in Manchester. Okay. At the, at Manchester Poly. Right. Uh, and uh, I loved my time there in the mid eighties. Manchester was buzzing then, as you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh, I love Manchester. It's such a wonderful city. Um, uh, last question, uh, Richard. Uh, what's the greatest jam record that's ever been made? Uh, single or album? Well, let's go single first of all. Single, um, well, I don't think you need to go much further than down in the tube station at midnight. Okay. Um, but uh, I've got, I've, I've got a great a soft spot for some of his more acoustic numbers, um, like Butterfly Collector. I think that lyric and that uh, melody is absolutely stunning. Yeah. And the and the album, I think, that for me is the definitive Paul Weller work is All Mod Comps, from which Down in the Tube Station came. Yeah. Great. And what's your, and what's your favourite Depeche Mode track ever? Well, I'll tell you in a second, but um, just going back to the jam, because I was I was I was an eighties kid. I discovered the jam when they released Beat Surrender. And I thought, I'm going to really get into this band. And then they <laughs> split up. So the final single. <laughs> it was the last thing. So I had to work my way backwards. But um, I love the Bitterest Pill by the jam. I think it's a great record. It's a great, yeah. The, I don't know if you ever saw the video for that. I don't it was some I... of the worst acting. In a, it's worth looking at it on YouTube. It is catastrophically bad. Yeah. And uh, well, Depeche Mode did, did a record called Walking in My Shoes, uh, which oh, yes. wasn't, wasn't a big hit, but it was on a brilliant album called Songs of Faith and Devotion, which is rich with theology and just a, uh, it, was, it was off his face really most of the time, but the, the, the words and the music was outstanding. And uh, Great album. It's actually the only Depeche Mode album I ever bought. Right. And, and I love it. I really love it. I do think it stood the test of time. Yeah. Um, no, I'll go back and listen to Walking in My Shoes yeah. um, when I get back to my apartment. Lovely. Well, Richard, it's been a real pleasure. It really has. I, I've enjoyed every moment of talking to you. And, Thank uh, you, Alan. It's been you know, a pleasure for me too. It's, you know, Jerusalem is always in my prayers. It, I, it's left a profound mark on me and, and I look forward to coming back as soon as possible. Uh, I, hope you, I hope you do. I look forward to welcoming you back and... Uh, Thank you for your time, and, and um, I, I pray blessings on all those who are listening to this and, and invite them to pray for the Holy Land and for all the peoples of this land, but uh, that we would be led into times of peace. Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much. And uh, many you. blessings from Burnley. God bless. Thank you so much. God bless Bye -bye. you too. Bye-bye. Yeah.